I'm delighted to be here once again with the Defence's Senior Leadership Group, whether you're here in person today within Adams Hall or if you're attending virtually. And I especially wish to acknowledge the participation of the Defence and Strategic Studies course, which is joining us also by video. As a course alumni myself, I know firsthand the tremendous benefit and the value of the year that you have spent together. I thought it important that you're here today because as graduates of the course, you will have influential roles in leading and shaping defence for the 21st century. And a very special and a very warm welcome to the international course members. I trust you've learnt a great deal about Australia during your time on the course, just as I know from my own experience that your presence and your wisdom will have enriched your Australian colleagues. And I also sincerely thank the Institute of Public Administration Australia for live streaming my speech this morning. The Institute's thought leadership and strengthening of our public sector is very highly valued. Ideals that are entirely complementary to the work that I'm launching here today. But before I do so, I'd like to acknowledge that this has been a very, very difficult few weeks for the ADF, but also for defence and the broader defence and veteran communities. And there are still some very challenging times ahead for us all. I don't wish to say anything more about it here this morning other than to reinforce a simple message. A strong and resilient defence organisation can and it will continue to deal with big challenges and be better for it. Ladies and gentlemen, my job as Minister for Defence is to see the world as it really is, not as we wish it still might be. This lens ensures that the ADF is prepared and equipped to deliver the capability our nation requires today and into the future. 17 months ago, when I was appointed Minister, I set three priorities for the defence portfolio. The first is strategy, the second is capability, and the third is reform. These three priorities underpin all aspects of defence's performance, its planning, and its activities. The Defence Strategic Update and the Force Structure Plan together address the first two of my priorities, strategy and capability. Reform is their natural and the necessary facilitator as its companion. But this, the fact for us all today is this, is that changing circumstances are a reality for all Australians and not just for defence. We are all having to recalibrate our thinking, our systems, our institutions, and indeed our very lives. History, however, has shown over and over and over again humanity's capacity to adapt and to evolve. A fast moving world means more demands are being placed on this capacity, making it even more challenging to do all of the things that we must as a society and also as defence. This year, our nation's attention has rightly been focused on the challenges of responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, our strategic circumstances were changing and deteriorating well before then. You are all very well aware of what is happening in our region, the Indo-Pacific. Countries are modernising their militaries and accelerating their preparedness for conflict. New weapons and new technologies are transforming the characteristics of warfare. Some nations are increasingly employing coercive tactics in the grey zone, which directly impacts on our sovereignty. Great power competition is causing the most consequential strategic realignment since the end of World War II. And as the Prime Minister observed this week, a new era of geo geopolitical competition is now underway a form of geopolitical contest that is different to the Cold War. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the strategic circumstances now facing our nation. Circumstances that call on the expertise, the resilience and the adaptability of each and every defence public servant and each and every member of the ADF, together as one defence. 
Our military history is replete with examples of the agility and the innovation of Australian men and women on operations. Qualities once again drawn upon this year. As bushfires swept across our country, defence was there, helping so many Australians in so many stricken communities through Operation Bushfire Assist. And then, just as the fires abated, COVID-19 came ashore, and Operation COVID-19 commenced. Again, defence responded deftly, professionally, and simply magnificently. In undertaking these domestic operations, Defence did not diminish its warfighting capability or compromise its core mission. So when I reflect on Defence's agility this year, I know it can and I know it must step up again in new ways to meet the raft of challenges facing our nation now and into the future. The 2024 Structure Plan demands Defence work faster and smarter than ever before. This plan comes with enormous financial responsibilities and also enormous expectations. That taxpayers' dollars will be spent wisely, they will be spent strategically and spent in our nation's interest. More than 400 capability decisions have been made by this government in recent years. Since I became Minister, uh, the government has made over 110 capability decisions worth over $15 billion. But, but, with $270 billion of capability being acquired over the next decade alone, we must get better. We must get a lot better at delivering and sustaining our capability. The government has met its commitment to growing the defence budget to 2% of GDP. Defence's funding has now been decoupled from GDP avoiding the need to regularly adjust plans and also our purchases in response to GDP fluctuations. The government has agreed to a long-term funding model providing certainty for defence planners and also for defence industry. $575 billion, over half a trillion dollars, has been allocated to defence over the coming decade. I cannot impress on you enough how hard this was fought for, and how quickly it can go if we do not manage taxpayers' money well. But this investment reflects the government's concern about our deteriorating regional environment. It also reflects my and the government's confidence that defence can transform to deliver what you have all been entrusted to deliver. As you are all very well aware, defence focus is now on three new strategic objectives. To shape, to deter, and to respond. The question these beg for all of us here are these. Is defence best positioned to execute this strategy? Is defence best placed to deliver the capability across more than 190 major acquisition projects? I think it's safe to say that there is a collective and a very collectively strong will and determination to do this. But at the same time, I think it is safe to say that we all know there is much work to be done and very little time to achieve it. Work needs to be done to improve Defence's capacity to develop and employ capability while retaining the ability to adapt further. Work must be done to ensure that all contracts are entered into and managed wisely and also managed transparently. Work must also be done to enhance Defence's ability to operate as a single enterprise with a truly, a truly strategic centre. A Defence enterprise functioning as a fully joined up and highly performing entity. Not simply single services supported and enabled by interlinked, very complex interlinks interlinks between defence groups. And to evoke Sir John Monash's imagery, defence needs to perform as an orchestra, all playing from the same song sheet. So ladies and gentlemen, given our strategic circumstances, continual improvements must be made 
to the large and complex machinery that is the defence enterprise. And these improvements come through my third priority, and that is reform. Strategic leadership is synonymous with change leadership. The challenges that demand change are quite often matched or even surpassed by the challenges of the change itself. And from my experiences in both the army and in politics, I've learnt three things about reform. First, that it tends to be reactive to problems and to external criticisms, typically driven by that external stimulus, a burning platform. Second, uh, reform often has to row full crew against apathy and against resistance. And third, reform tends to happen unevenly, unevenly across an organisation. So what do I mean by reform? When I say reform, I mean continuous transformation. Big, deliberate, ongoing change. Change in business as usual, change in thinking, change in ethos, and change in outcomes. Transformation is not, it is not about homogenising defence and service cultures. However, continuous transformation is all about defence becoming a single, strategy-led and centrally directed organisation, becoming even more effective in responding to an uncertain and a volatile external environment, becoming even more adaptable to strategic and technological trends, and becoming a more agile and a more proactive organisation. Each of you and each of your teams uniquely contribute to Defence's strategic objectives to shape, to deter and to respond. Your individual and your collective efforts towards the Defence mission are at the heart of this reform, this transformational process. And the outcomes of which I am extremely delighted to announce here today. So to the Secretary of Defence, Greg Moriarty, to the Chief of the Defence Force, General Angus Campbell, to the Associate Secretary, Catherine Jones, and to the Vice Chief of the Defence Force, Vice Admiral uh, David Johnson, and to the brilliant team so ably led by Tom Clark, and of course to my own team, and in particular to David Mulhall, for your passion and your commitment to make today a reality. So I thank all of you most sincerely for your leadership and for your support in developing this most important of packages of work. The Defence Transformation Strategy sets out the vision, but importantly, it also sets out the framework for Defence's journey of continuous transformation. One of the key points I want to leave you with is this, that this is a strategy developed by Defence for Defence. Defence must now embrace its own strategy. Defence must own this challenge intellectually, culturally, and also practically. And as Defence's senior leaders, you are the champions and the guides of this strategy for the organisation, for your own people, but also for our nation. The strategy acknowledges that large-scale transformation necessitates cultural change, and that our Defence people will be the source of and the reason for our success. This strategy sets the conditions for your success. It does this by providing the vision and the framework, as I've said, for long-term enterprise-wide transformation. One that continually assesses and also adjusts defence's strategic purpose and its performance, its organisational behaviour, its structural fit, and its governance and accountability frameworks. And let me be very, very clear. Transformation is not about start and stop activities and reforms. These activities are defined by fixed end states, by time, by structure, and by output. Instead, what this strategy is all about is a continuous journey through a series of waypoints waypoints that keep adapting to changes in our strategic circumstances and also to rapid technological change. The Defence Transformation Strategy, as its start point, details three significant work packages. Firstly, a continuous improvement culture. 
Secondly, an enduring transformation system. And thirdly, priority reforms. These three work packages, over time, will fundamentally change the way defence works. They will ensure that defence continues to evolve and adapt over time as one defence. Since the 2015 First Principles Review, defence has changed and it has enhanced its structures, its governance arrangements, its accountabilities and its processes to a more mature one defence system. Our goal is now to embed one defence in both philosophy and also in practice. I'd like to take, talk a little bit more now about each of the three work packages. The first work package, a continuous improvement culture, has three major initiatives. The first is embedding defence values and behaviours. Responding to our strategic circumstances and to delivering on the government's agenda hinges on our people. How you work, behave, interact, think, adapt and lead. Across the services, across the organisation, you, together, have already reached common ground on a unifying set of values. Service, courage, respect, integrity and excellence. This, I think, is extremely significant. Your contribution to this initiative demonstrates your broader commitment to defence reform. And for that, I thank you. The second initiative in the first work package is Evolving Defence's Accountability Framework. Accountability in defence has improved in recent years, particularly through capabilities being managed as programs, not as individual projects. But I think everybody here in this room knows there is still much more to be done. It is timely now to update and clarify accountabilities to support decision making, problem solving and risk management by all of you as our senior leaders. A baseline review of all SES and star rank accountabilities will be undertaken to examine responsibilities, authorities, performance measures and also allocated resources. The third initiative in the first work package is becoming a more data informed defence organisation. Under this initiative, Defence will adopt a far more disciplined and deliberative approach to how information is collected, how it's stored, analysed and how it's utilised. A Defence data strategy will be released next year to guide data management and to improve data literacy. So I'll now turn to the second work package, establishing an, establishing an enduring transformational system. Defence's capability and sustainment planning must now drive Defence's enterprise and business planning. Defence's continuous transformation is contingent on enterprise business reform. We simply cannot do it without it. To deliver this, Defence will develop and embed a new business transformation cycle. The cycle itself will focus on enterprise level business planning and on genuine enterprise level risk. The Investment Committee currently directs the Defence Capability Assessment Program. And in the same vein, the Enterprise Business Committee must drive and govern all reform activities within Defence. This also means improving Defence's business practices, its systems and also its service delivery. And I now turn to the third work package, our priority reform areas. Defence exists to deliver military capability. Without capability, our strategy to shape the environment and deter aggression will simply not be possible. The Drive to Improve Capability Delivery Initiative uh, will deliver defence capability through clearer and more streamlined acquisition processes. This reform will enable defence to better demonstrate to Australian taxpayers that it is effectively managing its assets in service. And critically, it will enable defence to meet capability delivery milestones. Key to achieving this will be clarifying and strengthening accountabilities of capability managers and also corporate enabling groups. The next initiative in the third package is strengthening defence's approach to Australian industry capability. 
The government is committed to seeing more Australian companies delivering and sustaining world-class capabilities for the ADF. To do this, we have to further develop our sovereign industrial base. We must work to make it more robust and more resilient with greater international competitiveness and export potential. And innovation and Australian science and technology are of course integral to this. And to that end, the Defence Science and Technology Strategy 2030 has been released and is already further enhancing that collaboration. Now to the next initiative in the third package, adopting a strategic approach to defence enterprise resilience. Under this initiative, defence will embrace and embed new ways of working to bolster enterprise productivity, effectiveness, and also resilience. The Improving Defence Strategic Workforce Planning, Learning and Management initiative will better manage the growth in the defence workforce's budget. And this integrated workforce concept will form the basis of a new defence strategic workforce plan to be released next year. And now to an initiative that will underpin our transformational success, instituting an improved enterprise performance measurement and reporting framework. Defining and measuring strategic performance in a meaningful, consistent and transparent way is absolutely crucial. Because measuring performance increases transparency. And transparency to the Australian Parliament and to the Australian people and of course to executive government is a central tenet of our liberal democracy. In this initiative, Defence will establish longitudinal benchmarks for better predictive information, to better identify and assess enterprise risk, and to better report on directed outcomes rather than reporting on process. This last initiative, sorry, the last initiative in this work package is improving our engagement and also our communications. Last year, the Prime Minister stated that all Australians need to be at the centre of APS service delivery. That all public servants must have a clear line of sight between what they're doing and the Australian people. Transparent communication about Defence's activities is essential for maintaining Australians' trust. And that is never more truer than it is today. And defence must also get better, much better, much better, at explaining why and how defence is acquiring, how it is developing, how it is sustaining, and how it is employing our capabilities. So in conclusion, I say to all of you here today, embracing and implementing the defence transformation strategy is each of your responsibilities no matter your location, no matter your position, no matter your rank. Continuous transformation is essential for building defence capacity to respond to a far more uncertain geostrategic circumstances and also so that we can respond to rapid technological change. It's all about getting the right things done in the best possible way, in the best interests of our nation's defence. It is also about transparency to all Australians through the government and through the parliament. So ladies and gentlemen, this is a strategy developed by defence for defence. Work that must be and will be led by defence's strategic centre. This is our duty to our fellow Australians. Defence has the strategy. Defence has the plan. Defence has the, mundi the funding to meet everything that our nation is asking of us. I have every confidence that defence is capable of delivering. Thank you very much.